Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Rome's ongoing persecution of Bible believers only convinced them that she was indeed the great whore of Revelation chapter 17. The woman that sits atop the scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy. In the Geneva translation, we read, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and in her forehead was a name written, a mystery, that great Babylon, that mother of whoredoms and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great marvel. The scripture says the woman is a city that sits upon seven mountains or hills. The Geneva translators wrote, Very children know what that seven-hilled city is, which is so much spoken of. That is the damnable harlot, the spiritual Babylon, which is Rome. In manner of deeds she is red with blood, and sheddeth it most licentiously, and therefore is colored with the blood of the saints. Meanwhile, their view of the Pope is shown in Revelation 11.7, which speaks of the beast that cometh out of the bottomless pit. The reformers wrote, That is the Pope that hath his power out of hell, and cometh thence. Needless to say, these teachings were offensive to Rome, but had been handed down for centuries. After the death of King James, his son Charles I took the throne. King Charles was a controversial monarch, accused by Protestants of popish and tyrannical actions, and was suspected of supporting an international papist conspiracy against the Protestant faith. It was during his reign that the Geneva Bible was outlawed. Could the footnotes concerning Rome have been the reason why? Originally, the word Protestant was a reference to those who protested the claims made by the Roman Church. Even in the 19th century, Charles Spurgeon said, For truth's sake, our Protestantism must protest perpetually, no peace with Rome. But in times past, such teachings from the Albigenses, the Waldenses, and to a great extent, those of Wycliffe and the Lollards were suppressed and nearly stamped out by the Crusades and Inquisitions. Yet with movable type, and the printing of books and Bibles faster than the popes could burn them. The teachings of the reformers spread like a fire across Europe. But some claim that it was not simply the teaching of salvation by grace that brought the reform, but the recognition of the papal system as the fulfillment of God's greatest warnings to the church, as set forth in the prophecies of the Bible. Was it this teaching that created such determination in men like Tyndale, Luther, and others? Protestant minister Dr. Ian Paisley writes, It has been claimed that when Luther recognized the papacy as Antichrist, it was only then that the Reformation gained momentum. Yet Luther himself acknowledged that what he was teaching did not begin with him but had been handed down from centuries earlier. He wrote, We are not the first to declare the papacy to be the kingdom of Antichrist, since for many years before us, so many and such great men, whose number is large and whose memory is eternal, have undertaken to express the same thing so clearly and plainly. Believing that the papacy is Antichrist, was standard for Reformed believers, who claimed the Pope was the prophetic fulfillment of the Apostle Paul's warning of that man of sin, the son of perdition, 
who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. They held to this view because in the New Testament the church is called the temple of God, and the popes were well known for exalting themselves in the midst of the church. Paul wrote, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Therefore let no man glory in men. Early Christians and the Reformers were very familiar with the blasphemous declarations from the papacy, which were often the subject of intense debate, because from ancient times the popes had declared themselves to be equal to God. Jesus said, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Yet the popes took to themselves the name Holy Father, along with all claims of authority that might be assumed by such a title. Pope Innocent III, who fathered the Inquisition, said, The Pope holdeth place on earth, not simply of a man, but of the true God. Meanwhile, Pope Nicholas said of himself, I am in all and above all so that God himself and I, the vicar of God, hath both one consistory, and I am able to do almost all that God can do. I then, being above all, seem by this reason to be above all gods. Nicholas even claimed that the popes had the power to change the gospel itself, saying, Wherefore, no marvel, if it be in my power to dispense with all things, yea, with the precepts of Christ. But in the Bible, Jesus says, Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, and no man openeth. The Apostle Paul warned that, If any man or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, let him be accursed. Yet despite these biblical warnings, the popes repeatedly claimed they were equal to and above God, and were even called by Catholics, our Lord God, the Pope. The Lateran Council, while addressing Pope Julius II, said to him, Take care that we lose not that salvation, that life and breath which thou hast given us, for thou art shepherd, thou art physician, thou art governor, Thou art husbandman, thou finally art another God on earth. In the 19th century, Cardinal Giuseppe Sarto, who would later become Pope Pius X, declared, The Pope is not simply the representative of Jesus Christ. On the contrary, he is Jesus Christ himself under the veil of the flesh. Does the Pope speak? It is Jesus Christ who is speaking. Hence, when anyone speaks of the Pope, it is not necessary to examine, but to obey. Jesus said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Yet Pope Pius IX blasphemously declared, I alone am the successor of the apostles, the vicar of Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The popes have not only made claims to be God, but have insisted that salvation itself depends directly upon obedience to them. Pope Boniface VIII said, We declare, say, define, and pronounce that it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman Pontiff. Pope Clement VI said, No man outside obedience to the Pope of Rome can ultimately be saved. All who have raised themselves against the faith of the Roman Church 
and died in final impenitence have been damned and gone down to hell. Even in modern times, Pope John XXIII in 1958 declared, Into this fold of Jesus Christ no man may enter unless he be led by the sovereign pontiff, and only if they be united to him can men be saved. In 1984, Pope John Paul II was quoted as saying, Don't go to God for forgiveness of sins. Come to me. The quote was based on a Los Angeles Times article which reported, rebutting a belief widely shared by Protestants and a growing number of Roman Catholics, Pope John Paul II dismissed the widespread idea that one can obtain forgiveness directly from God. Furthermore, according to traditional Catholicism, obedience to the papacy is said to be required, no matter how dreadful the Pope might be. Catherine of Siena, one of the patron saints of Italy, whose mummified head is still preserved in Rome today, said, Even if the Pope were Satan incarnate, we ought not to raise up our heads against him, but calmly lie down to rest in his bosom. He who rebels against our Father is condemned to death. For that which we do to him, we do to Christ. We honor Christ if we honor the Pope. Such demands for blind obedience were confirmed by the Popes themselves, but confronted by the Reformers. By men like Martin Luther, who said, The Pope, possessed by demons, defends his tyranny with the canon See Papa, or Yes Father. This canon states clearly, if the Pope should lead the whole world into the control of hell, he is nevertheless not to be contradicted. It's a terrible thing that on account of the authority of this man, we must lose our souls, which Christ redeemed with his precious blood. Because of this evidence, Luther declared, I believe the Pope is the masked and incarnate devil because he is the Antichrist. It is important to understand that this belief was not just confined to Luther but was held by all the reformers from John Wycliffe in the 14th century to Charles Spurgeon in the late 19th century. Spurgeon said, it is the bounden duty of every Christian to pray against Antichrist. And as to what Antichrist is, no sane man ought to raise a question. If it be not the popery in the Church of Rome, there is nothing in the world that can be called by that name. The Westminster Confession of Faith, along with the Savoy Confession, the Old Baptist Confession, and the Methodist views of John Wesley, all included the declaration that the Pope is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition, that exalteth himself in the church. This was also the belief of the men who translated the King James Bible. In their opening dedication, they commended the king for writing in defense of the truth, which hath given such a blow unto that man of sin as will not be healed. The view of the Antichrist, not as a single man, but of many men in a single office, was based in part on the teaching of John Wycliffe. In the Gospel of Matthew, the disciples asked Jesus, What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Wycliffe believed that the many who say, I am Christ, are in fact the popes. The Pope's title, Vicarius Christi, literally means another Christ. 
Wycliffe concluded that Antichrist is thus a monstrous composite. In further explaining the Pope's title, author Dave Hunt writes, the Latin equivalent of the Greek anti is vicarius, from which comes vicar. Thus, vicar of Christ literally means antichrist. But the view of the papacy as antichrist is not widely held by Protestants today. Still, there are those who continue to uphold the reformers' original beliefs. Perhaps it has something to do with this official Vatican portrait of the current Pope. It is called The Truth, The Way, and The Life, Portrait of His Holiness, Pope Benedict XVI. But can this really mean that in the modern world there are some who still believe the Pope to be equal to Christ and God? Mr. President, final question. Yes, sir. You said famously, when you looked into Vladimir Putin's eyes, you saw his soul. Yeah. When you look into Benedict XVI's eyes, what do you see? God. Good way to end the interview. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. My pleasure, sir. In contrast, Dr. Ian Paisley is a Protestant minister with a long history of opposing Rome's influence in Great Britain. He has been a member of the British and European parliaments and retired in 2008 as the First Minister of Northern Ireland. Paisley considers himself a modern successor of the Reformers. What follows is typical of his preaching. The darkest days in church history were always the brightest days for the Church of Jesus Christ. When they were burning, the saints of God, thank God the gospel burned with mighty fire. And thank God it was said in Scotland when they burned Patrick Hamilton, the first martyr of the Scottish Reformation, that everybody his smoke blew upon became a Christian and left old harlot, scarlet church of Rome. We need to discover that in the darkest day, God has victory for his people. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And thank God for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. In 1988, when Pope John Paul II delivered a speech at the European Parliament, Paisley opposed him, shouting the words of Archbishop Cranmer, who had been burned at the stake. Like the reformers of old, Paisley held up a sign and denounced the Pope as the Antichrist. Permit me to say how much I... you to stop this disturbance. There was another poster in his pocket for each one snatched away. The Pope, waiting with a text which spoke of Europe as the beacon of civilization, looked on with faint amusement. Mr. Paisley, I now exclude you from this house and for the remainder of the Mr. Paisley claims he was punched and that he later received a personal apology from the head of security for failing to protect him. The poster stated simply, John Paul II, Antichrist. I uh, am in the historic uh, succession of the reformers. I mean, uh, one wee lady wrote into the press and said I wrote the Confession of Faith and called the Pope the Antichrist. I mean, I was far from the first person who accepted the fact that the Church of Rome was a false church and therefore was the church as depicted in the, in the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation. Now, that is historic Protestantism. Paisley makes it clear that he still believes the Pope, or papal system, is the fulfillment of the biblical warnings about Antichrist. Yet it is only fair to acknowledge that many prophecy teachers today believe that the Antichrist is yet to come, but like the Popes, he will claim to be equal with God.
that someday there will emerge a man who proclaims that he is God. And of course, according to the Bible, this will be the Antichrist. But he is a man. But the Bible says Satan will empower him. But for the reformers, the Antichrist had already been revealed through the papacy. John Wycliffe was so convicted about it, he even said, why is it necessary in unbelief to look for another Antichrist? In 2 Thessalonians, when warning about the man of sin, Paul wrote, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Martin Luther believed that the reformers were themselves as the spirit of the Lord's mouth, and by preaching the word of God, they were consuming the papacy, even as fire consumes a bundle of wood. Luther wrote, For we must slay him with words. The mouth of Christ must do it. That is the way he is torn out of men's hearts, and his lies become known and despised. Let us be wise, thank God for his holy word, and be bold with our mouths. This is the way Christ is, through us, slaying the papacy. Luther believed that the papal antichrist would continue to be thus consumed until the Lord completely destroys him at Armageddon. As such, the need for translating and publishing the word of God was greater than ever. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. If you want to be victorious, if you want to start winning, then you're going to have to have the heart to fight. Amen. Did, you, did you hear what I just said? Amen. The first step, the first step in, in getting close to understanding this way of escape that God has for us, you've got to have the heart to fight. The heart, the actual desire to fight. Let me tell you why. You see, brothers and sisters, we have this thing called a fallen nature. A fallen nature, which naturally, let, 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 let Jeremiah talk to you a little about this. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? Mm -hmm. Jesus puts it like this, for out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. You have to understand that the natural state of mind, our natural desires usually are wrong. Without God working upon us, we are naturally fountains of evil. Let me tell you why this is a problem. Because if we are not connected, if we are not finally plugged into God, what happens is the devil comes with a temptation, and here's a little dirty secret. We want what he's tempting us with. Oh, can we be honest today? Oh, yes, we want what he's tempting us with. When, the, when you are, when you do not have a vital connection with God, when the devil says jump, you say how high. Yes. It is something that naturally resonates with us. When the devil tempts us, if we are not plugged in, we want it. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, 
because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Love is the face of God. It's the make of the being of God. his heart longing for love from me his compassion is tears for me love is the breath of God is the power that never chapter 4 verse 5 one Lord one faith one baptism so what does it mean one Lord turn with me to 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians and let's look what the, what the prophet what the Bible is saying 1 Corinthians chapter 1 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and let's begin with verse 10 1 Corinthians chapter 1 beginning with verse 10 and the Bible says now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no what? There be no what? There be no divisions among you. Are there divisions among us as God's people? 